we've got a lot to talk about. Uh, and fair warning, we're going to talk a lot about sports in, in, in a few minutes because this is an area not just for fans. We were talking backstage yep. about how much is going on from a fandom perspective right now. But from an investment perspective, too, such an interesting time. Before we get to that, you alluded to something that I think is a really nice way to set the table. The acceleration of your business over the last 18 to 24 months has been remarkable. Give us a, a state of play for Aries right now, sort of the, the lay of the land. Sure. Um, yeah, it's been a transformational couple of years, but really a transformational decade for our company and alts generally. So it was interesting hearing the prior panel was, was talking about the attractiveness of alts and I was all giddy until I saw the audience call and we, <laughs> like, know, womp, womp. it was yeah. a little bit of a letdown. But um, Aries today is a large global alternative asset manager. Uh, we have about $315 billion of AUM, 2,100 employees in 35 offices throughout the globe, North America, Europe, Middle East, Asia. Um, of that 315, close to 200 billion of it is broadly invested in the private credit markets. Right. Um, about 55, 60 billion of it is invested in the real asset space, real estate and infrastructure. Uh, about 30 billion of it is broadly invested in the private equity markets. Uh, and we have a growing business in secondaries and uh, Asia distressed right. for the remainder. So really do have a global view. It's an interesting perch, particularly in markets like this, to see equity and debt markets operating together across the globe. Right. Well, let's talk about that, that global reach. I want to pull up a, a Twitter poll here because I think you're going to have an interesting answer uh, versus uh, maybe what the Twitterverse said or a more nuanced answer, uh, as tends to be when you're talking <laughs> about Twitter. Uh, so which country or region will offer the best returns over the next five years? U.S., Europe, China, emerging markets. I have a feeling your answer is going to vary depending on which of your colleagues you might have been talking to last. Yeah, well, I, I, I form my own opinions, right? It's not the last person that, that I've talked to. But <laughs> oh, that, oh, wow. I didn't, I didn't mean it as a burn, no, but I, I that's interesting that you took it that I, way. I'm, wow. I'm kidding. I did. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it speaks volumes, I think, to the strength and, you know, fallibility of, of Twitter sometimes, is that seems like a simple question, but for someone like me in my seat, are we talking about public equity markets or private equity markets? Are we talking about credit or right. equity? Are we talking about, you know, so when I look at that, I would say generally I would agree that the U.S. markets writ large across what we do will generally outperform. Uh, I think particularly given where the world is today, just capturing the next 12 to 24 months of exposure to the U.S. markets versus China, as an example, will help you outperform. But when I look around the globe at the things that we can invest in, one of the highest risk adjusted returns I see now is, for example, investing distressed in Asia Pacific yeah. and China specifically. So there will be spots within those, those geographies that I think will stand out, but I, I would agree that I think the U.S., for a whole host of reasons, is going to be the best backdrop. And has geopolitics made its way in a made a meaningful impact yet, especially war in Ukraine, on, on sort of what you're seeing in terms of performance? No, you know, the, the challenge with this environment is, and, and one of the benefits of being in the private markets, is we get real-time information from our portfolios. So the joy of being in the alternative asset space is we have, you know, perfect inside information because we are controlling companies and, and uh, partnering with management. Everything that we've seen to date has been unbelievably strong. Hmm. And so telling everybody what they know, the economy is on very sound fundamental footing. And now it's really the question of the look forward. Uh, even in Europe, having just come back and spent time with our teams there, the effects of the conflict in the Ukraine have not found their way into, into the portfolios. Now, we don't have a lot of direct exposure. Right. So we would be talking about second and third derivative type uh, consequences, so it, it will take some time. You do begin to see it happen more quickly in places like just who's allocating, Yeah. right? So if you have large sovereigns who benefit from rising energy prices, you may see them more actively allocating as oil prices rise. So there are a lot of 
influences, but generally speaking, those markets just aren't really developed enough right. for the type of alternative investing that we do. So, you know, thankfully, we just don't have a lot of direct, direct exposure. So speaking of alternatives and, and speaking of something that might influence those Twitter, Twitterers, tweeters, uh, is exposure to, to private markets. In a way, you and I were talking backstage about the fact that exposure to private equity and private capital has been like the holy grail yep. for retail yeah. investors for a long time. High net worth has sort of made its way in, especially um, in a more meaningful way over the past few years. Just yesterday, you guys, I, I believe, keep me honest here, announced a new fund uh, really aimed at getting folks from a retail perspective into uh, the private equity markets, the private markets. Tell me how that works and, and what that represents. Yeah, so there's there's a, a fair amount to unpack there and maybe just broadly, and it segues a little bit from what was talked about on the prior panel. If you look across the entire available investment universe and you just say, generally traditional versus alts or publics versus privates and really start just delineating. What you see is that the alternative asset space generally is growing at a two times rate to the traditional markets. So roughly 10% per year compound annual growth rate. People expect that to continue for a decade plus versus four or five. Mm -hmm. What, what's not in those numbers, but it helps support the growth, is structurally, alternative assets don't have to be in the market. So one of the challenges of investing in liquid markets is the fund structures themselves force you to take a view on a market through investing, whereas in the private markets, you can express a view by not investing. Right. You also uh, can time your exits. So you can manage volatility much easier. And the fund structures don't have outflow. So when you go through volatile markets, you're not having to defend your existing positions and reallocate your book as aggressively. So there's a lot structurally that just sets alts up to grow continuously. So as a result of that, what has happened over time is we're generating pretty significant excess return relative to what I would call the public market right. equivalent. So private equity will generate consistently through cycles higher rate of return than public equity. Private credit will generally generate excess return relative to syndicated loans and high yield bonds and so on and so forth. So not surprisingly, putting aside what we all expect will happen over the next 12 to 24 months, we've been a three decade long secular deceleration in interest rates. So every investor on the planet, whether you're an insurance company, pension fund, or a retiree who happens to be living longer, you need excess return and right. yield uh, quite desperately in some cases. And so that's fueling this, this demand. It's really a hunger for that yield and that excess return in this interest rate backdrop. Um, but now that people have experienced that excess return, we are seeing that demand be persistent. What you're hinting at is this: there's a new secular shift happening that's a combination of folks like Aries packaging alternatives for the retail consumer and the large wealth platforms now rewiring the way that they're selling these products to access retail demand for alternatives. Right. And that is a little bit of a holy grail, not necessarily for us because that capital is available to us, but for the retail investor. Yeah. Because if you think about historically 10 years ago when we were selling product to retail, it was high net worth and ultra high net worth, and they were effectively tagging along with our institutional clients over the last five years, we now have credit product, we have real estate product, and now private equity product that mass affluent and true retail investors can access with partial liquidity, which is a real revolution in terms of their ability to consume what used to just be the purview of, of the institutional investor in the high net worth. Right. It's so interesting to think about the, the menu that, that's available both to retail investors. And so let's shift the conversation a little bit because you and I know each other pretty well. We're both big sports fans. In fact, we are. we're marveling the idea Masters is teeing off today with Tiger Woods. NBA playoffs, very much on the mind of your uh, colleague Tony Ressler and, and the Atlanta Hawks. We just came off of March Madness. We've got opening day, opening day today um, for baseball. A little belatedly, but we got there. <laughs> we're all good. It's all fine. Um, this is now investable yep. in a way that if we were talking even five, 10 years ago, was just not on the table. I mean, I look at what you guys have done. 
F1, Major League Baseball, European soccer, and more, and, and soccer here in the European football, American soccer. I'm trying to mind my piece of hearts here. <laughs> um, how do you do that? And, and how does that come about yeah. that that becomes something that is interesting to you? So we obviously have personal investments in sports that inform our view on long-term value creation. And through that lens, what we know is if you look at value creation in just owning sports franchises, for the last 20 years, they've all outperformed the S&P by varying margins, but pretty significant. So if you look at compound annual growth rate in the value of sports franchises, it's been 15% and largely non-correlated to other asset classes that you can invest in. So putting aside personal tax attribution, all the fun that you have, right. it's just a really interesting exposure, but it's never really been thought of as an alternative asset class that's accessible to many people. Um, COVID changed that, and I think we, we were fortunate enough to, to see that trend emerging and innovate a little bit. And the reason that COVID changed it is prior to the pandemic, the opportunity to invest in sports was largely the bastion of ultra high net worth individuals and banks. Yeah. And at least in the US, the leagues were fairly protective of the, the sanctity of that capital structure, rightfully so. Um, but when you start seeing a world where you don't have fans in seats, games are canceled, there's no merchandise sales, contracts around your sponsorship or challenge, you begin to realize that there is a need over a longer period of time for flexible capital solutions to be available to these teams, leagues, owners. Um, and that in order to preserve this 15% compound annual growth rate, you need to start thinking about alternative forms of capital because the amount of capital in that high net worth and bank channel is not enough, frankly, to support that kind of compounding for the foreseeable future. So when COVID hit, a lot of very high quality franchises were seeing a need for capital just to bridge liquidity right. or to invest in growth and really try to you know, punch through that in a different way. And so we leaned in on that and, and accelerated our strategy to bring our institutional capital solutions into the sports arena. Uh, and it's been very well received to your point. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to invest all up and down uh, the sports ecosystem. And when you really peel it back, it's about content. And right. so when we think about sports, it's sports, media, and entertainment, and it's the entire ecosystem of sports, whether that's venues and stadium finance, media rights securitizations, um, merch, consumables, sports betting, in-game ad tech. So right. when you really get into this world and you say, what's driving these values? It's it's content, and, and now with the advent of streaming, the highest value content is live, unscripted, right. and in sports, it's live, unscripted, and parsable, right? right? So it's probably one of the most consumable forms of content, so and, it's super and, exciting. And global, too. I mean, I think about the idea that just by dint of circumstance, we're looking at you know, some of the biggest trades that we've seen about to happen, one in the U.S. with, yep. with the Broncos, one in England um, with Chelsea. As you think about those valuations, I, I have to think those skyrocketing, skyrocketing valuations have some, something to do with the opportunity here, right? And, and how do they? I, 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 they're both super exciting assets. Yeah. Um, both benefit from scarcity value. So harking back to even the prior conversation on the prior panel, there is a scarcity value store of value play when you're talking about elite franchises like Chelsea. But to your point, it's the globalization, and right. we see this in our existing investments, is you know, China is one of the largest growth markets for the NBA. And so just being able to see that and understand what the development of that fan base means for the value of your brand and your content is a totally different world than we we used to live in. And so I think you, you have to detach from, and it's hard for a lot of private market folks who are focused on cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, but you have a significant amount of very high quality assets 
with varying levels of cash flow that yeah. continued to increase in value because of the global right. global brand. And the business, I, I think what's also interesting, you and I have talked about this, is that the business models are different from country to country, from, from league to league in terms of what you can do. You've seen more flexibility come in on, say, the NBA where Dial is, yeah, is sure. offering a product. You, I do wonder if the NFL and the EPL, you know, start to do that just because these are... You, you, you have to imagine, and again, I don't have any right. knowledge to say one way or the other on the NFL, but it, if you just look at the value of the franchises and you look at who owns them, and it's we didn't talk about our retail private equity fund that we talked about is largely anchored by a secondary strategy. Right. And if you think about who owns franchises, there's obviously control owners, but there's also a whole universe of smaller minority LPs that are the beneficiaries of all this value creation in illiquid assets. Right. So you talk about the dials of the world. There is also an opportunity to just think about, you know, a monetization event for those smaller LPs over time, which right. is effectively a sports secondary. Yeah. Um, and so that Im the embedded universe of folks who own these assets but don't really have a path to liquidity is just by definition going to have to create a need for institutional capital to, to clean that up. So what sport are you most excited about? Not as a fan. I know what you like. In, but in, in it, terms it, of it, value in creation? In terms of value creation. You know, it's... It's interesting. I'm going to give you two answers. Okay. Um, because if you think about the major U.S. leagues, they probably give the, the highest total return. Mm -hmm. They're the best run, most viewed, best media rights, you know, globally recognizable. So dollar for dollar, you probably want to be there. But when you go across the world, the other regions offer you, you know, much healthier profit models yeah. just based on the way that those those teams are structured. So I think it really depends on how you think about investing in this space. If you're looking for compounding total return, you'd probably gravitate towards trophy leagues, trophy assets. If you're really coming at it from a structured credit, structured debt perspective, you're probably going to gravitate to the cash flowing areas like European football and, and yeah. things like that. And so as we start to wrap up the conversation, I mean, put this in the context of sort of the, the broader investment outlook, because, you know, one of the fun things about sports I've found is that you do sort of see cultural touchstones, economic cut touchstones, to your point, sort of growth versus, um, you know, value in, in, in some ways. So as you synthesize all of that, you know, what's the general mood inside your shop broadly a, a, about the world? Um, cautious, but probably not as negative as the public markets are feeling. Uh, and I think part of that is if you, if you really peel back and look at what's taken the public equity markets to the current levels and what's going to obviously have us give some of that back is it's been led by a handful of very large tech names uh, with high growth rates and we're changing the discount rate. So by definition, we're going to have to see values correct. Um, we're all going to be dealing with that in our equity portfolios right. to some extent, but you know we're not we're not going into this current cycle with that amount of overshooting on value and discount rate. So I think we've the private equity markets are going to have a, an easier time digesting. Uh, the reason we feel so good in our shop is, you know, like I said, 200 billion of our 300 billion is private credit. Right. And that's all floating rate secured debt. And so, you know, from a positioning standpoint, as rates go up, our portfolios actually generate higher rates of return. And as you asked about the last couple of years, we've been fortunate that part of our transformation has been an acceleration in our fundraising. And so, you know, we're coming into this market with a significant amount of uninvested capital available to us to navigate the markets. Um, but I go back to what we're seeing in our portfolios and, and we've never really seen this type of, of cycle where we have demand side pressure, supply side pressure and a geopolitical overlay. So right. we all have to learn as we go here. But some of the demand has to be temporary. 
in the sense that we're still digesting a significant amount of government stimulus and the transformation of the labor market. And some of the supply chain challenges we're, we're seeing have to be temporary as well, just given COVID issues uh, in the APAC region and, and some labor issues that we're having here. So, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic that, that we're going to be able to, to right. navigate this. Obviously, the Fed has a pretty significant job ahead of them. But when you look at what we're seeing in the portfolios, there's just a lot of buffer that's been created right. in terms of balance sheet health, cash flow growth, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. I think gives us a little bit of time here to, to try to get this right.